Are you looking for a way to grow a farm to be profitable and sustainable over time? And this is what I mean. You go from a homestead where you're providing for yourself to a farm that's serving your community. I'm Justin Hit with Prosperity Homestead. I'm going to do a few direct to camera answering questions about uh, folks' concerns. And if you didn't know, the channel has a lot of traffic from India and the United States. And in the past, I've answered business development questions for farms or entrepreneurs in Africa and India as well. So I'm going to share a solution that works whether you're in the United States, in a rural community, or outside of an urban space, or you're in India or Africa, and you want to grow a profitable farm. Now, this is not the same run-of-the-mill information you're going to find when people sell these uh a business opportunity, you know, make $100,000 a year running your farm. This is based on sustainable community development, and it's done in such a way that serves your family first. So it's not about building a business in order to generate income. It is first about uh, producing a profitable farm in your own community. Just as I borrow techniques from Southeast Asia, Africa, um, all over the world in order to apply in the demonstration gardens that I work in, uh, I want to share a method that seems to work very well across different developing, developing communities as well as communities that are facing hardship. So in the United States, the hardship is inflation. Inflation is increasing the cost. Breeder stock is very expensive. But we also have the problem where uh, meat processing centers are not as available. In India, they have some economic challenges, but they also have a large and growing population. In Africa, for example, being such a large continent, there's a variety of differences and problems that can do from rural areas not having the tools and resources to the availability of non-GMO seeds. Now, all of these problems impact everybody in the audience that we're talking about today, but I want to make sure you understand that this solution works so well. It's actually a six-step approach that you could implement it in your community today. And it has to do with the massive opportunity of farming cooperatives. Now, this isn't the usual cooperative you find in the United States where people pool their money together and then they, they either borrow money out of the cooperative or they, uh, they farm, uh, you know, group buys in the cooperative. But, but that's part of it, too. It's, but I'm talking about starting with something even uh, easier, something that works starting at your home or your homestead so that you can have a small, profitable farm. Let's get started. First off, this is going to be direct to camera. There's not going to be any slides or anything. I'm here with my pot of tea and my mug, and I'm going to just simply share with you the six strategies. Now, you can do these in any order, but I'm going to try to present them to you in a logical order, but these strategies help you create a profitable farm. Now, again, I keep saying small farm because this is not intended for you to become some international conglomerate or for you to create a cooperative and then buy out your partners so that you can consolidate and have this big, massive farm. This is about regional agriculture that is sustainable, regenerative, and ultimately provides for your immediate community. Okay, so this has been a big concern. I'll get a, a I was doing this uh, consulting uh, uh, for free um, because I was getting my permaculture design certification. I was also, I'm currently in a naturalist program. I have a passion for regenerative agriculture. So this was not consulting work. So I, as I do always in my podcasts and my, you know, any channel communications, you can write in with your questions. And when you write in with your questions, I will earnestly answer your questions to the best of my ability, or I'll simply let you know that I don't have an answer and send you someplace that has a credible answer. But I would get these letters and these questions from individuals in Africa who were literally in vi villages with mud huts. OK, so they send me the video and they have a mud hut and they say we're poor and we can't afford equipment to properly farm. I said, well, look, send me some pictures of what you got. OK, because I don't really care if you live in a mud hut or an adobe house or a straw bale house or a house made of, you know, tin panels. As long as it's a safe habitat, so you're living in an environment that's safe for you, that, uh, you know, protects you from the, the weather elements and such. I don't really care. I'm not, there's no judgment on my part here. But when you tell me you're poor 
And then you take pictures of your environment. And I see pigs, for example. I see chickens. I see uh, uh, other things that are there. You're actually much richer than you might imagine. Now, this is Africa. And I know a lot of people in the American audience might think of Africa as being mud huts. But really, Africa is a very sophisticated place, no different than much, many parts of the United States. So when I say mud huts, the proxy in the United States is the little uh, you know, rundown shack or the old, old house in India. It might be a shack or whatever. But what I'm saying is if you believe you don't have the resources to build a sustainable farm that is profitable, meaning the farm produces more income than your state, than the expenses you spend, then please understand it is a mindset challenge, not a practical challenge. So this individual shows me around the village and they have rich culture, they have festivals, they have a strong uh, relational bond between individuals. They do have some small livestock, like I mentioned, the pig and the, the pigs, plural, and they also have the chickens. Uh, they have sugar cane. And they had some crops nearby. Now, what I did notice is there was very little vegetation because, again, they're in an African uh, uh, climate that is uh, very dry. And I, so I, I asked some questions. But what we determined was is that there were enough people in the village that were interested in farming that if they could use some basic techniques. Now, this individual had access to YouTube. And um, I showed them some, some different videos that were relevant for their area. I also showed them what was happening in Uganda, what was happening in Kenya. Uh, and, and, and it was a matter of their dry, arid area wasn't retaining enough water to maintain their crops. And they went from above ground gardens that the, uh, the NGOs came in and had them doing to uh, gardens that were sunk in the soil. And suddenly they're growing like crazy. They went from having these pigs roaming freely around the village to having these pigs in uh, specific areas uh, where th they would moisten the ground and then the pigs would dig in the ground and make uh, make these sunken gardens. But they would also uh, compact areas that would allow the trapping of rain because it did rain there every so often. And so I didn't solve their problem with my knowledge. I was able to see across the communities and beyond the mindset that they were too poor to show them ways that with primitive tools, they could start gardens. Now I, I was in a, they did start asking for money. So there was a, there could have been a little scam element here. Um, but I assured them that they could achieve their goals without money. And here's what they did. They basically impounded the, uh, the, the pigs into an area uh, and then those pigs kind of turn up the soil because that's what pigs do. And by turning up the soil, they were able to put a better garden in there. Now, this individual didn't have enough land to farm, but collectively in the community, they had enough land to farm. So they would just keep repeating that pig tractor and then farm, then adding small crops behind. I encouraged them to do subsistence farming first. And again, this is a this is an email back and forth thing. I wasn't talking to them on the phone. I wasn't being paid to consult with them. So I would simply show them the videos that were necessary and they did all the work. Now, any of their household organic waste, and I've written a lot about how to process organic waste was being uh, given to their chickens up to the point where they started humanure toilets. So they, they, they used humanure toilets. They would grow a lot of biomass and use that to decompose the human waste. Uh, which then would be used in the garden areas that were sunken, of course. And then when it rained, all that nutrient stayed in the garden area and grew corn. And um, there was a couple of vegetables I didn't recognize, but basically kind of like gourds and starchy vegetables. Um, again, they did this when they are what the rest of the world would consider poor and desolate. Um, they turned it into a small oasis. Now they still had like, they still had mud huts and stuff, but again, in that climate, that was a, uh, a type of appropriate infrastructure that provided shade and provided uh, shelter. Now, they ended up working with other organizations. They started their own seed banks. They did so many other things. My key point for bringing this up is that it was a few ideas to get them past the poor mindset. I see a lot of homesteading videos that are basically poverty porn. Okay, They show how you can live on little or no money. What I'm talking about here with building a cooperative and profitable, profitable farm is about making an income beyond your needs with the farm. Because we know with seasons, 
that farming could be great this year and then next year it could not be great. Um, now, I will tell you that I am I am collect, using information here and I'm synthesizing a concept for you that I have not lived myself. So I am a reporter in this and I'm delivering to you what I've seen in the business world. So a little background about me. I have a risk management and business development background. I've helped businesses create more than $300 million in, in new business by actual sales and marketing techniques, but also to eliminate millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in fines, regulatory risk, um, failures in their systems uh, by using process optimization. So I'm looking at this based on what generally works with human groups and how you can implement your own environment. I also grew up in Southern Maryland. So my my father was a part of a, a rabbit co-op and I've seen other cooperatives. I've been a part of the Southern States co-op for a while, although not as active as, as other people. Um, I can show you a six step system that works, but you have to understand this is not about barely making it by. This is about thriving and being profitable at your homestead first. Okay. This is not about you sitting at the farmer's market. There, there are great programs that'll teach you how to do that. And they have more experience. This is about the mindset and the approach necessary for you to build a very sustainable community. And I do have psycho uh, psychology and sociology education and experience to, to tell you, this will build a strong community uh, that will protect you against environmental disaster socioeconomic or, or, or countrywide disaster, and also uh, the challenges that you may face when it comes to uh, what a lot of people are calling climate change. You know, the solar minimums going on. Uh, you do have uh, localized natural disasters that impact farming, droughts, heavy rain conditions. Okay, so let's get, let's get right into this. Okay, there are six steps. They're going to help you develop a profitable farm and the concept is not that your farm alone is profitable. Your farm alone provides for your food, shelter, and safety. But the farm cooperative in which you're a member of, could be just you and your neighbors, by the way, is what makes it profitable. And it's because we're not just looking at dollar value. This is very important. When we have fiat currencies and inflation, the dollars you have in your pocket lose value every day. They are, uh, they're actually a liability. However, small livestock such as rabbits, pigs, uh, chickens, they increase in value as they naturally replicate and produce more of the same. The same thing with heritage breed uh, animals, seeds, uh, especially when they're non-GMO seeds, non-licensed seeds, trees and plants that are non-licensed, you can propagate those to make more of the same so that you can increase your abundance even if the monetary system is collapsing around you. Okay, do you does this make sense? The first thing you're going to do in this system is you're going to acquire land in the region. Now, I'm saying acquire land as if you require land. And if that if you have the mindset that you're going to do this all by yourself, then you're going to have challenges. So yes, you could apply this concept on acquiring land for your homestead, but I'm saying you actively interact and communicate with your neighbors and you acquire land that is uh, symbiosis or, or, or beneficial to each, each other so that you can farm or you can grow on a larger space. They aren't making any more land. Land tends to hold value. So, for example, there are some folks that sell programs on how to make $100,000 a year being a farmer, and they acquire their neighbor's land through a lease or a partnership. Okay? So you might be saying, oh, I'm poor. I don't have the money to buy the equipment or whatever. Ignore the finances because this plan works even during inflation, and it works even if there's a complete collapse of the economy around you. Now, I could go into why it works. You know, uh, some of these models I borrowed from the Great Depression. I've, I had a friend, for example, whose family lived through the Great Depression. And I asked him, what was it like? He's 98 years old. I say, what was it like to be during the Great Depression? And he says, family never noticed. And I said, well, why? He says, first off, we had land that was productive. 
Number two is that they overproduce. They create. They were producers rather than consumers. I said, well, why, why did that help? And he explained that everything their family could not eat or it would spoil before they could eat, they would sell or trade to their neighbors and they had more than they needed. And very quickly, they were able to build abundance. They were able to acquire land. I've heard about this in some of my other programs, but they were able to acquire land to extend their operation. In some cases, they they actually created tenant farmers. Now, again, um, you know, there's a feudalism coming along where the few own the land and they have others work that land. Um, you know, that it's a model that, that worked during the Dark Ages. It worked during uh, different economic changes over time. I'm saying that while you acquire this land, either in a partnership, by yourself, you want to acquire land that can be systematically improved. So number two is that you systematically improve the land that you have and the land around you. So I mentioned heritage breed seeds, seeds that are true to seed. Okay. So you have some idle land. You cannot afford to put it into crop because you don't have the resources to harvest it. Um, but you could put it into seed farm. So you can multiply the seeds that you have. You could introduce uh, animals to graze on that land or to start preparing that land. So I have access to some forest land that was forested probably 15 years ago or, or less. And the land has not come back well. It wasn't planted or anything. And it has just randomly come back. So it's mostly overgrown with briars. Introducing goats to that environment is better than clearing the land or spending the money to clear the land. You've seen some of those videos on my channel where I sent in a forest mulcher to make trails. So we, we create the access points. We started outlining paddocks. And then ultimately we put up, we're going to put up some temporary fences to have uh, goats come in there. I didn't come up with that idea myself. I listened to what's going on in the community. I looked at how other people have transformed land over time. And then I borrowed that model to systematically improve the land. So the day one that that forest mulcher went through, because it's all underbrush, it's like uh, scrub land. It's less desirable land. I got it at a really good price. Um, the day one that that forest mulcher went through, it opened access points and roads. It cleared paths so that I could get through the land to survey it better. It cleared out large areas that could be for holding areas for animals or uh, staging areas for a paddock and cell system. Again, your land will be different, but whether it's land you own or land you rent, acquire the land, and then number two, systematically improve the land. Now, the reason we're improving the land is because we're, we're adding value to the land to make it more productive for our small livestock, our garden area, or whatever we're going to do with that particular piece of land. Now, there's no sense acquiring land that you're not going to use. Make sure you do get land that has some plan tied to it. We talk about that in a lot of videos. So when I put this online as a, a tutorial, I'll have links below to the other videos that I'm, I'm referencing here. The land must have a plan. If you don't have a plan, then invest those funds back into the farm or the land that you already have. You really want to start where you are. Number three is you want to choose cooperative farms. So these are farms. You can do this right now. Let's say you're living in an apartment and you're dreaming and wishing you had your own homestead. You can choose cooperative farms right now by going to the farmer's market, by going to the local store and doing business with somebody who is functioning the way you'd want to function in the future. So for example, um, heritage breed hogs, I buy that from a certain farmer here uh, because they're they're taking well care of. But I also buy pork from uh, Sandy River Meats, for example, um, because they have quality uh quality meat and the money I know is going directly to the farmer and it's going directly to the people who work in that store. This is very important. This is very important because you can start where you are today by choosing the farms in which you buy direct from. Okay, this gives them capital to get started. It also gives you interactions with a farmer so you can get a better understanding of how in your region people are farming. So you want to know how the food is grown. You want to know that the seed is viable. Okay, now this is important. If the seed is viable and you're buying vegetables from a local farmer, then that seed will grow in your yard. Do you see where I'm coming from here? 
So you're already cooperating with a local farm in this cooperative by doing business with that local farmer. Now, that doesn't entitle you to any particular rights or, you know, it doesn't mean they're going to cooperate with you in the future. But if you don't start interacting in this environment, if you don't start cultivating those relationships, then it will be harder when you're in a position where you're going to start implementing the entire plan. So the way this plan works is you go through the six steps and then you go through them again and you go through them again, building on your past successes. So that that village in Africa that has the strong culture, that has a, a community, that has young men to work, that has uh, things that they can do from crafts perspective, they're building on a small amount of information to start getting more reliable crops. So NGOs came in and told them to do raised bed gardens and in a dry climate that doesn't work. They ended up doing sunken gardens on a few conversations back and forth. And I literally pointed them to videos in Kenya and Uganda. So these are neighboring areas that they can go and visit. And it was the spark that got them to where they're having consistent crops uh, vegetables and, and starchy foods and stuff, uh, more pigs, by the way, pig can grow and can have a litter of 12 other pigs. So that, again, that's a multiplication of the wealth and prosperity of the village. They were able to start uh, a small little shop. Uh, now I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with this next part. And in fact, they were reaching out to multiple people. So, um, I, I do not want or deserve any credit for what this village has done, but the village ended up, uh, basically, selling the pigs into their local market. So they set up their own local market and they sold the pigs into the local market. So everybody's buying these pigs. These pigs are actually being lent out to other farmers to develop crop space. Now, the problem with pigs when they, they dig an area out is they do compact it. So um, that's good in a in a area in a dry climate because it, the, when periodically when they do get rains, it actually floods the uh, the growing areas and then soaks that water down into the ground slowly or absorbs into their plants. Um, but that may not be a good idea in an environment that gets a lot of rain. So again, uh, sharing the concept that they took a small amount of information and built on it and they went from being dirt poor with no, you know, they wanted tractors and they wanted equipment and they, and they wanted money, but they didn't need any of that because they already had what was necessary. And then they, they added their festivals already included, um, you know, butchering a fat pig from the season and sharing it with their neighbors. Uh, and in that they were able to share what they were doing. So they passed along the education, but they were also able to get and recruit workers. So, you don't have to pay your workers with money. You can pay your workers with a fat pig. You can pay your workers with vegetables. You can pay your workers with the things that they want and desire and need. So again, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in India, whether you're in Africa, these types of things are universal. I focus on universal solutions. So let's get back. Your cooperative farming by how you spend your money or your time. So I volunteer on someone else's farm and I volunteer and work for free. I have been paid. I've been paid in meat. I've been paid in chicken. I've been paid in vegetables. Um, I'm getting exercise too. So I think I'm the one winning out of this whole deal. But again, if you don't make these connections and build these relationships, then you will not have access because there could be a time where you need the food more than you need to own the land. And so if you're not willing to work, then that food isn't going to come your way. Another example is, is breeding pairs. So goats and rabbits, for example, they, they multiply, pigs multiply. And the, very often, if the male is isolated from the female, um, they're more likely to copulate, do their, do their thing. Um, and so very often what goat farmers will do or what uh, rabbit, and, and this is from my my dad being a part of a rabbit growers association is they would actually have partnerships with other growers and pass around a male. So this male would, would inseminate the, uh, the, the females that are available in one group and then they would swap males and then they would have an opportunity for the unbred uh, females to be bred by a new male. And uh, this happens again, goats and, and rabbits and pigs and uh, not necessarily in chickens because you can incubate, you can have a rooster um, uh, fertilize a lot of eggs and then you can put them in an incubator. 
So it's a little bit different with chickens. But my point being is you could have a partnership with another farm. So let's say you have a small homestead where you're keeping 25 chickens to raise eggs, which go to the cooperative, which is some kind of agreement where you're going to provide eggs wholesale to the other farmer, and then they're going to sell them to their customers. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But number four is that you're first going to grow for self-sufficiency. So in the case of breeding pairs, you may be in this cooperative in order to exchange males after all of your females have, have bred uh, so that you don't get inbreeding and so that you can get valuable uh, traits. And the cooperation is simply a handshake shake agreement that you're going to buy similar stock. So you guys go to the market together. You buy two males instead of one. You get a little better price because you're buying two. And then one male goes to one farm and one male goes to the other farm. And then you swap after the uh, breeding sets have been had. And then you're keeping track mutually of the uh, genetics so that you're not accidentally inbreeding your animals. Um, it might be as simple cooperative as uh, as you're helping to harvest their chickens while you're raising pigs and they come and help you harvest your pigs. It's kind of like being neighborly, but you're growing first for self-sufficiency. You're growing first to provide for the community of individuals who are interacting before you're creating surplus for the marketplace. Surplus will happen, by the way, if you do this right. Regenerative farming is going to increase the value of your land, increase the quality of the nutrients in your land, but it's also going to, because you're using non-GMO, is allow you to retain the rights to the seed, to the breeding stock, and to the uh, plants that you're growing. Very important stuff here, folks. Very important stuff here. I hope you're keeping up. Um, and by the way, my computer is giving me these, um, these alerts about the performance being slow. So if there's something going on in the video that doesn't make sense or something gets cut off, please uh, type in the comments below the question and I'll create a supplementary video to go in the tutorial and everybody who comments below, I'll make sure that you get free access to the tutorial that brings that information together so that you can learn how to build a cooperative uh, community that helps for the profitability of all farms in the area. Now, why are we growing first for self-sufficiency? If you have a good set of neighbors, so you're living on a farm and it's five acres because you don't need a lot of acreage to do this. And you got a neighbor across the street from you. You got a neighbor to your left. You got a neighbor to your right. And you got a neighbor behind you. That is four people in your community. Now it can go further. There's a neighbor to the left and right of the neighbor across the street, which is kind of also your neighbor. And so you can have five or six people in your community, which is your small geographically located place. You can have friends down the street. If these people are taken care of and there's an economic disruption, then you have someone looking out for your interests. Think about this. Who are you going to protect and check in on periodically? It's going to be your friends and neighbors. By building self-sufficiency in your friends and neighbors first, I know there's a lot of appeals to help the folks in Africa, but you know those people in Africa are well capable of helping themselves. I know there's a lot of appeals to help the people in the Appalachian Mountains, but if you get out of their business and you leave them alone, the folks in Appalachia can take care of themselves. Well, I, I currently live in the foothills of Appalachia, and I know some of them folks, and they are well able to take care of themselves if folks would just leave them the hell alone. Now, I mentioned the NGO coming in and providing a solution. There was a good solution for the NGO but not a practical solution for the local people. If you're cooperating with your neighbors and interacting with your neighbors, get to know them, you will find solutions that are best for that locality, whether it's the climate, whether it's the, the land topography, or other types of things that can get you to the point where your neighbors are taken care of. Hungry neighbors, a fence will not protect. They'll poach your animals and you'll poach their animals. It's always best to take care of your neighbors. Now, this, again, could be a church, you know, within your church community or your church family. But I'm saying practically those neighbors on the left, on the right, whatever. Now, again, when it comes to farming in a more modern area that's maybe near an urban space, you want to make sure your neighbors are your customers at a minimum. Why is this? Now, again, I told you I have some background in psychology and sociology. A neighbor who is your customer 
will not complain about your farm's condition. There's a lot of folks out there that don't understand what tall grass means. You know, right before you cut hay, the grass is a little bit tall. The tall grass gets cut down, and then the field looks like a lawn. People in their brain think that a lawn is good because that's what they see in their little urban spaces. They don't realize that the grass has to grow tall in order to make hay. If you don't make the hay, you're not feeding the animals. So if your neighbors are your customers at a minimum, you will have a, a symbiotic relationship where they depend on you and therefore will allow your farm to continue. And I do say allow because I've, I've worked on projects, personal experience here, that I knew followed state and federal guidelines. I knew were better for the environment, that were stable for long term, you know, uh, prevented erosion and other issues. And then turn around and have one of my neighbors uh, try to file a public nuisance against me and basically shut down my project. And so what I ended up doing is, uh, is I had hedges because, I, again, I'm applying what we're describing here, but not necessarily do I own my own profitable small farm. But because I'm building self-sufficiency in my community, I have access to farms that are profitable. Can you see how this works? Okay, this is different than what you're seeing. A lot of American um, media is about you, is about you. Now, I'm not talking about socialism or communism here. I'm talking about a strong and stable community where you are a leader in that community and you work with other leaders in that community to provide for your neighbors. So this could be a church family with a community garden. This could be a, a fraternal organization that takes the excess landscape and turns it into a, a, a garden. Now, this could be a flower garden. This could be a vegetable garden. But again, first, it is for the members uh, before anything else. Now, you can, as step five talks about, cultivate mutual markets so that maybe you're selling eggs to the neighbors. So when I was a kid, my, my parents allowed my brothers to sell off the excess eggs to the neighbors and keep some of the money as a way of teaching them entrepreneurship. It's a way to get them involved with caring for the animals. But if your neighbors are buying your eggs, could they be buying the honey of your cooperative partner down the street? Now, I'm going to talk about whole, there's a lot of complex ways to make this arrangement, and, and we won't get there until number six, which is the business models. But it could be as simple as referring that customer. Or it could be that you own the customer and you develop the market. And then these other farms can sell to that customer. So I mentioned Sandy River Meats. If I go to Sandy River Meats, I can buy meat from Sandy River, the, you know, that farm. But I'm also going to get other produce and vegetables and stuff from their cooperative partners. Do you see where this is coming here? By creating your own market or bringing to market goods from your partners, you're able to deliver better value to that customer and that customer is less likely to complain about what you're doing. Now, again, because you have self-sufficiency for your community first, if a competitor comes along and steals your customer, you still got self-sufficiency for your community. So you're not really at loss. Okay. So let's get to number five, which is growing and cultivating mutual markets. Now, I was a, it, with a group called Field to Friends around here, and the group did okay, and then it kind of fizzled off. Um, understandably, a lot of these groups, what I'm describing here works, but it won't always work because of the individuals. Uh, it'll always work for you if you follow it, but you know, you'll have people come and go. So somebody will, uh, will come in, and they want to go to the big farmer's market, and they want to sit at the farmer's market, and you provide them uh, produce, for example. And the farmer's market just bombs. And so they're not profitable going there. They buy the produce from you wholesale. They take it to market. Nothing happens. And then they go out of business. Now, the back end part where you help them uh, or you cooperatively work together, um, it, you know, with your loyalty of purchase, with your, uh, you know, your cooperative, how, how you, you know, maybe they grow tomatoes and you don't grow tomatoes. Or maybe you grow tomatoes and they grow tomatoes because if one crop fails, you're going to have something to take the market. There is some uh, flexibility in here. So we talk about profits. Uh, profits is not just financial profits. This is, this is understanding that the relationship has as much value as the money. And then uh, the breeding stock is important as well. So 
what is the mark? What is the market going to be for you? The market starts with your partners in this cooperative. And this is a formal group that meets periodically, that discusses the issues going on, uh, talks about, hey, I'm going to go up to, uh, we have Floyd, Virginia here. I, I call up the folks in the in the uh, partnership or field of friends or or relationships I have. And I say, look, I'm going up to, uh, to this place to buy some stuff. Uh, I got a pickup truck. I'd be more than happy to pick up some other things. What do you want? They go to the website. They either... Uh, you know, set up an order or they give me a list to, to place the order. I go pick up the product. And when they get here, we split it up. So we would buy 50 pound bags of stuff and I'd split it up. So I'd take half of it out to the place I was volunteering and donate it to the place I was volunteering. And I'd plant the other half a seed at my place. And it was, it works. But if we're going to create markets, that's understanding that if we've got five farmers and four markets, that we can have, a, a we can have the co combined produce or the pro combined product go to all four markets if there are people who are willing to sit at the market. Because uh, you may not want to sit at the market. You might be working a day job and you don't want to sit at the market on the weekend. Or maybe you've got to use those weekends to, to uh, manage your farm. Number six, and again, this is all very high level. If you have questions specific to what we're talking about here, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, everything that we talk about is going to be put into a tutorial that would be very reasonably priced. Now, here's the thing about the tutorial, and I'll just share uh, five, five minutes about this real quick uh, because this is of great benefit to you uh, before we get into the, the business model, which is step six. First off, what I'm sharing here is very doable for anybody who has any amount of land or no land at all. So even if all you do is buy from local farms and start building those relationships, understanding where your food is coming from, you will profit because you'll get better quality food. You'll improve your health. It'll improve your uh, inter interconnections. Um, I'm the kind of person that sometimes can go quite a while without speaking with other people and uh, that's good for me sometimes, and sometimes it's not. If you're able to know that if you went to such and such a market, you'd see a friendly face, somebody you knew, they'd ask you how your day was and actually give a damn. Uh, this is a mental health aspect that you gain whether or not you have a farm. Now, the next level is that you have a homestead, and now you're interacting with people and you're doing these group buys and you're taking your pro excess product and selling it to your neighbors and now you get a little extra income and now you get to the case like the like the gentleman i met at the uh, tractor supply uh, actually it was rural king how's that rural? if if you're watching i remember you and you told me about the three pigs you're gonna buy and so real quick we'll do a little tangent uh if you buy three pigs and you sell two of them now you gotta have a market to sell them to and that's why we're talking about step five that you got to have a market. But if you raise three pigs and sell two, you'll generate enough income from the two pigs to pay for all three pigs and you get free meat. And a pig that grows 200 pounds means could be 200 pounds of free meat in your fridge. Now, the labor involved, I argue you should calculate that into the, to the equation. This gentleman didn't care because he, he likes growing his pigs. Uh, pigs are so funny and, uh, you know, they can, they can be quite interesting. And plus, think about this. If the pig is working on your farm doing what pigs love to do, such as tilling up ground or preparing garden areas or helping you with an with a, a, a erosion, um, you know, sediment pond, um, or they're sealing your pond, that pig's going to do so much more work than they're, than it costs uh, for you as far as labor is concerned. And so it actually is a huge value to you. Now, before we talk about business models, it also matters uh, this concept that if you're acquiring land in the region and you put someone else on the farm, so maybe you have the means to acquire the farm, but you don't have the, the strength. And there are days I'll, you know, I was looking at the demographics on my YouTube channel. There's some 65 year old and better uh, folks on uh, on my on my channel watching, and I hope you're living vicariously. But you may have the means to get a farm going. But uh, I'm 48 years old, and there are times that I get a little worn out doing the farming, especially uh, having an office job most of the time, or or having uh, you know being in front of the computer all the time. Um, six five year old boys, a lot a lot more muscle than I got. 
But again, if you don't have the strength to run the farm, you could be the business manager. You could sit at the farmer's market. You could provide the land to a younger farmer who's, who's ready to go. Perhaps you're a retired farmer. Why lose the land? If you can have somebody else work in it and they pay you a, a minor leasing fee. But again, you have to make sure, and this is number two, like we talked about earlier, you got to make sure the land is being systematically improved. There are ways to farm land, to rape the land and take as much out of the land as possible and then just go get another piece of land. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, cultivating community relationships quality of the environment in the in the region in which we're doing this and improving our overall activity. Now, I, I left some of you guys from India out. Um, there's a gentleman from India that was asking me about farming in a rural area and um, business development. He was actually using um, Upwork to do uh, business outsourcing services, but he really would rather be farming. And so one day I was talking to him on the phone. I hired him to do some uh, secretarial work for me. And I'm talking to him on the phone. I said, is that chicken in the background? And he apologized. This happened with the guy in the Philippines too. He apologized. I said, why are you apologizing? Have you seen what I look like? Have you seen the content I put out there? Which he, which he had seen. Um, you know, chickens, you know, how many do you've got? What are they doing? Are they, are they meat birds? Are they, are they uh, egg birds? And he told me about he wanted to run a farm. And he was near the city. And so he could take his eggs into, and, and this is one of the things he did. He took his eggs into the local market, sold his eggs made almost as much money as he was netting with the, uh, the services work. But he was thinking about these ideas of what else could he be doing. He was developing a kind of reverse engineering his market. He knew a market existed and he's reverse engineering the products that he can produce to take to market. Now he had really good marketing skills. So uh, he ended up doing some of what we're talking about here by instead of going to market with just his eggs, he went to market with his neighbor's eggs as well. Now, I'm not sure whether he wholesale purchased the eggs from his neighbor or he's doing a 50-50 split. We're going to talk about that kind of thing here in a bit with the business models. But he was be able to explore his passions doing remote work. And he lived kind of outside the city. He was in a rural area, um, probably what you call suburbs in the United States. Uh, but again, he had chickens. And he had a, a few other things growing on in his uh, little small garden there. And he ended up... Um, Still working for me for a while, uh, but he also ended up where his him and his wife would go into the market on the weekend. See, they're going into the market anyway to buy. Why not take some product to sell? They got to the point where they the the amount of things they bought at the market was equal to the amount of money they made selling the surplus from their own property. Think about that, folks. You go to market with product and you come home with product. And no money was ex was uh, out of your pocket. That's how you build wealth. That's how you expand your experience and improve your life no matter what is going on. Um, now, I'm going to package this stuff into a tutorial that I guarantee will be affordable to someone in India and in Africa and the United States the same. Because this is a groundbreaking and foundational part of transforming your land into higher utility value. What do I mean by utility value? Step four, growing for self-sufficiency. Step three, cooperative farming, buying and selling to your neighbors. Step two, systematically improving the land, regenerative farming, make the land worth more. Are you able? Are you in a dry climate and you can impound that water to soak it and spread it in the land? Are you in a wet climate where you can move that water through the land in a way that reduces erosion and helps you keep more nutrients on your land. These are the powerful things that we're talking about here. Again, if there's anything that sparks your interest and you have a question, you visit me at www.prosperityhomestead.org and then you go to the contact page and ask your question. I'll be sure to answer it. And then down in the comments below, be sure to ask your questions. Everyone who asks, asks questions are going to get an immense discount on the pre-launch of this program. And of course the program is going to collect links to all these different videos that I've mentioned. I actually have some really good videos that where they um, rehydrated parts of India um, using swales and earthworks. And, and I should reference that as well. Uh, let's get to number six because I'm going to wrap up and get some breakfast here. Um, number six is a clear business model. So I'm encouraging you to acquire land. 
Okay, that's a that's a financial output. Or if you don't want to acquire land to to purchase to cooperate with those who have land under rental agreements or whatever. The business model has to do with clear accounting. So when you are breeding animals, you need to keep records. I know a lot of you folks just think farmers are stupid and they don't have farmers got to keep records because if you start inbreeding those animals, you're going to lose the favorable traits of domestic animals. Same thing with uh, fruits and vegetables. A lot of times if you raise seed on your farm, that seed will not be as good as the original seed that you had. Um, especially if these things start crossbreeding, cross-pollinating, and very often you need seed from someone else's farm in order to get the traits that you're looking for. So what is the agreement? Now, there are many different business models. I want you to choose a business model that works for you. So let's say you're a homestead and you're going to grow enough vegetable, enough small livestock in order to feed your own family. That is 100% out, money out. A business model is when you grow enough that the surplus of your growth pays for the consumption. Listen very carefully. When you calculate your cost to grow, you subtract as an expense the consumption done locally on your, on your property. I want you to get in a situation that the surplus you take to the market pays for the materials that you bring back from the market or the surplus that you sell in your community, like the gentleman at the, at the rural King, uh, by sell He knows that selling two, he buys three P I'm going to explain it to you so that everybody understands it. He buys three feeder hogs and raises them out to butcher. He knows which butcher to take the two to. I uh, actually took all three of them. Actually he took them to the butcher and he knows that he's got, customers to buy whole hog or half hog for the two that he's selling. And he knows that the two he's selling pays for the one he's taking home, putting in the freezer. He knows his family needs about a hundred pounds of meat every year from pig. So he's got chickens and stuff too, but let's just talk about pig. He knows these numbers. He knows it's three, not two. He knows it's three, not four. Do you see where I'm coming from here? You have to do the math. Any number of rabbits you raise, you are nearly always end up with 22 rabbits. So if you've got two rabbits that you breed, the first, so you have a male and a female. I'm going to tell you a little bit about birds and bees here. This is business model that you have to understand. Okay, we're a little out of focus here, folks. I hope this isn't your brain getting tired on me. Pay attention. If you have two rabbits and they breed, Mama rabbit can produce eight more rabbits. It could be 12 more rabbits. It could be almost 20 rabbits. It depends on what's going on. Those rabbits can't breed with Papa. That's inbreeding. So you need to have a new male come in to breed on the second set of rabbits. And let's say there's eight. And each of those eight rabbits produce eight more rabbits. Nearly, when we, my dad was growing, raising rabbits, we had a, like a 12 by 12 shed and it like always had 20 to 22 rabbits. The joke was you could start with two rabbits. You're always going to end up with 22 rabbits. And if you're not planning for the 22 rabbits, they won't have good, healthy uh, growing conditions. You won't be able to properly manage the waste of the rabbits. And you want to process everything on the farm. If you're creating organic waste from rabbits, pigs, chickens, bedding from horses or other animals or you want to make sure that goes into a composting system so that's part of your model you're going to compost the waste in order to create nutrients for your crops you're not going down to southern states and buying a bag of 10 10 10 you're creating it on farm because number four is grow for self-sufficiency but you're not so see I, this is where i get in trouble see in the united states it's all about you but really, if you're going to be a successful, it's about you and your neighbors. And so maybe you got a neighbor. And in this case, I, I called up the folks at Field the Friends. I called up the folks in my, my farming network. And I got my official farm and beard and everything. I call them up and I say, look, the equestrian center has about 150 cubic yards of manure. Who wants it? Three farms raised their hand. I hired a tractor, tra uh, not a tractor trailer, but like a dump truck and a guy with an excavator, I sent them down to the school. 
They cleaned out all 154 yards of material, which, by the way, the school was immensely happy with this because the school had had some of that manure for maybe eight to eight years or so. So we're now getting aged horse manure into tractor trailers. We're taking 100 loads, you know, we're taking loads of, of material out of there, not 100 loads because the tractor held 13 yards. We took 13 yards to one farm. We took two loads to another farm. I got two loads of this material. And we ultimately were able to solve a problem for a institution in our community while solving problems for the farms in the community. That's part of your business model. You know, there are waste streams. Um, could be uh, rice hulls. It could be uh, the, the shells off of a cotton. It could be uh, wool batting uh, that comes from a mill nearby. It could be wood chips from the local wood tri trimmers. Document these resources. Put them in your plan. Because you may need these materials and you might not use it all, but you can arrange for it to be used. One of the conditions with the equestrian center is that we had to move all the material because I was going to send a dump truck and a bulldozer, not a bulldozer, like a front end loader. And if I was going to do that, I'd take it all. And we had no problem with that. And actually the, the hauling company that, that did the work has a standing relationship now that if I want uh, 13 cubic yards of aged manure, now, it's not so much age because we took it all. And now, the, you know, the horses have to poop it back. So you can only do this like once every couple of years. But my point being, the waste on one farm might be an input to another farm, which reduces the cost in your model so that you can be more profitable. Uh, there's a local animal petting place here that has manures from like eight to 10 different types of animals. I sent over, uh, I went over there and picked up two cubic yards. I've sent people over there to pick up materials. It's helping the nonprofit, but it's also helping uh, with nutrients. And that's nutrients we don't have to purchase. I also mentioned, you know, those uh, cooperative runs to different types of, of uh, wholesale providers it lowers your costs. This is in your business model. So you want to focus on health over financials. So is everybody in the cooperative living good, taking care of each other? Are they taking care of themselves? The financials do matter, though, because outside of your network, money is going to be the best way to pay for things. Uh, are you able to buy things wholesale to resell? Now, a farmer that I know was buying things wholesale from. So I mentioned if there's four markets, one farmer can't be at all four markets. So this farmer was buying wholesale from other people. And one of the markets decided that because they didn't grow the food, they couldn't sell the food. That's bullshit. Okay. I have excused my language. But again, these cooperatives may run into obstacles like that. Have you planned for that in your model? How does that farmer get compensated? You know, if they can only take their product to that market, how are they benefiting? Well, they might not be benefiting. They withdrawed from that market and then they went to the other markets and gave the other farmers some relief. That's a way to solve the problem. Um, you want to have clear agreements between farmers. I know if you're really good friends with somebody, you can shake their hand. I personally like to have written agreements. So if I'm going to hold $10,000 in livestock on my property and we have an agreement to swap the mail so that I can get breeders, um, because again, that's another way of multiplying your wealth by breeding the females and having the skill set in order to, um, to, to make that happen healthy for the animals. Remember, we're focusing on health before we're focusing on the wealth. Because health is wealth. So um, I need to have the skills. So I'm actually learning those skills now before we put a written agreement together where I'm going to be holding their breeding stock or in, uh, in partnership. Now, I do have some uh, copies of agreements. I do have um, uh, kind of the model of the different kinds of cooperatives. If you're interested in that and you have three or more individuals who you've described with this plan, You've, sh you've sent them to this video, I will be more than happy to do a, a pro bono consultation with you over some kind of video chat. So we'll record it, but um, I'll be happy to answer all your questions live uh, if, you're, uh, if you've got three or more people, and each of those three need to have attended this video that we're talking about right now. So before we wrap up, there are six steps. First, you're going to acquire the land in a region. If this land is geographically close to each other, it's going to be easier to get equipment back and forth. I didn't even mention uh, sharing of equipment. Uh, you know, 
Uh, you know, a lot of hay balers these days don't own their own, own hay equipment. They have hay equipment from an older farmer that they travel around the area and bale the hay, and then they pay the older farmer, um, or they pay them in hay sometimes. But uh, acquire land in a region. If possible, you and your neighbors are going to be the best for this cooperative. Number two is systematically improve the land. And this could be by working with each other, uh, addressing runoff issues, addressing erosion. You want the land better for the cooperative because the land will increase in value and that land will give you leverage. Number three is you want to choose cooperative farmers. You don't want to just put a, a Craigslist ad out or, or just say, who wants to help me with farming? You need to know these people and trust these people. This is your community. That's why I always say, start with the church group, start with a fraternity group, start with a business alliance or some cooperative that has a good uh, structure. Uh, because again, you are cooperating. If you can't cooperate, this ain't going to work for anybody. Number four, grow for self-sufficiency. If you can feed yourself first, if your neighbor can feed themselves, they ain't likely to come and try to take your stuff. Even if, if you have a, a, a situation where you have a major economic disaster, major environmental disaster, you're able to come together because you've already invested in each other's well-being to take care of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the basics. If the basics are taken care of in your own family and in the communities of your neighbors, then you will, it'll be great. You don't need to worry about the neighbor on the other side of the planet. You know, everybody talks about the one world village. No, take care of your neighbors in the immediate proximity. Number five, cultivate mutual markets. I think that's kind of spoken. I've spoken a lot to that. And number six is a clear business model. Again, if you have specific questions about what business model worked for you, I was talking to somebody who had a 200 acre farm. So you may not know. I volunteered for an organization called SCORE. So I was a SCORE mentor. SCORE is the Society of uh, something of retired executives. Anyway, I ran companies and I was helping there. Somebody had a 200-acre farm and it actually had four houses on it. And farming wasn't the best solution. Uh, actually, renting the houses out generated more income while they were determining what they wanted to grow on the farm. And they rented some of the, far some of the houses out to farmers who then paid them on the acre for the land they were using and then the, the woman who owned the property ended up being the primary manager of the property rather than an actual farmer. So she did some small gardening and things. But the, the other folks that rented the houses from her actually ran the whole farm. So she created a tenant farming system out of some land that she inherited and couldn't manage herself. So that's way better than selling the land. And it generated for her passive income that gave her some long-term value. So again, if you have questions about this, uh, any of these steps, especially building a business model, the business model is the most um, unique to you and your skill set. All of this together, here's the takeaway. You'll have a stronger community. You'll have a more productive market. You're going to attract outside money. Okay. So your surplus is going to be able to feed this market People are going to come into this market. It could be a physical space that's like a farmer's market, or it could just be wholesale selling into uh, you know, local uh, value-added providers. Uh, but ultimately, the community value of this is massive. Now, I will give you some caveats before I close. This does not work at a massive scale. You're going to have three to five individuals who are closely associated, who are the core of this cooperative. The overall co cooperative could have nine to 12 members in it. Uh, but again, there's going to be this core leadership position. I encourage you to be on that leadership, to take a leadership role. This works at the smallest scale of your own homestead. But again, if you can't be profitable on your own homestead with your neighbors, with the where you choose to spend money, then you need to work on that first. So again, if you've got three to five acres, and you're interested in solutions to grow your homestead or into a small farm, then you're going to visit www.prosperityhomestead.org. Okay, I got a lot of resources there. It'll point you to the YouTube channel. It'll point you to the podcast. I think it's like 180 episodes in the podcast. That's where you start. Now, if you've got five acres or more, and you've got three or more partners in your farm cooperative, 
I am available for paid consultations, but because you've invested the time to listen to this program, and if you sign up on the landing page, it gives you these additional resources I've been mentioning, uh, you are eligible for a complimentary, just one, we're not going to be pen pals, but just one complimentary interactive consultation. We'll spend 15 minutes if you want, or we'll spend three hours on the phone if you want. But to look at your unique situation to come up with how do we build a sustainable, profitable, and growing farm enterprise so that you can take care of your family and that you have a stronger, more stable community. So I grew up around Amish. I can share some of the models that they had. I, again, I've worked with small businesses and growing in the business development side outside of any kind of agriculture. I do have a permaculture design certification. I'm finishing off a naturalist certification in the state of Virginia. I am very familiar with the, um, the Mid-Atlantic area and, and how, how the climate and, the, and, and things run here, all the way from the ocean, all the way out to here in Martinsville. Uh, if you are interested in that kind of engagement, you need, to, you need to get below here and ask your questions, and you need to let me know from the website contact page that this is something you want to do. And I, again, one complimentary, if you have three or more people who have gone through this tutorial as well, and you're serious about having self-sufficiency, and whether you're in Africa, India, or the United States, I would be more than happy to hear of your successes and to help you get that seed that you need to grow and have the farm of your dream, to have a small farm or homestead that serves your family for generations. I'm Justin Hitt with Prosperity Homestead. I want to thank you for being a part of this program. Again, I will answer every question you post below. And um, be sure to pass this along to your friends. I, again, I see too much of this homesteading stuff, which is essentially poverty porn, and, and everybody's showing off what they've done on their homestead, but a lot of people going broke. This program has been about you having a profitable homestead that provides for your family needs through a network of local community which will sustain economic disaster, natural disaster, political problems, and more. You'll be able to defend the health, wealth, and wisdom of your community as it grows for long-term prosperity. Again, thank you for listening. I'm Justin Hitt, and questions below. <laughs>